Dear Esther, the gulls do not land here anymore. I've noticed that this year they seem to shun the place. Maybe it's the depletion of the fishing stock driving them away. Perhaps it's me. When he first landed here, Donnelly wrote that the herds were sickly and their shepherds the lowest of the miserable classes that populate these Hebridean islands. 300 years later, even they have departed. Donnelly reported the legend of the hermit, a holy man who sought solitude in its most pure form. Allegedly, he rode here from the mainland in a boat without a bottom, so all the creatures of the sea could rise at night to converse with him. How disappointed he must have been with their chatter. Perhaps now, when all that haunts the ocean is the rubbish dumped from the tankers, he'd find more peace. They say he threw his arms wide in a valley on the south side and the cliff opened up to provide him shelter. They say he died of fever 116 years later. The shepherds left gifts for him at the mouth of the cave, but Donnelly records they never claimed to have seen him. I have visited the cave and I have left my gifts, but like them, I appear to be an unworthy subject of his solitude. There was once talk of a wind farm out here, away from the rage and the intolerance of the masses. The sea, they said, is too rough for the turbines to stand. They clearly never came here to experience the becalming for themselves. Personally, I would have supported it. Turbines would be a fitting contemporary refuge for a hermit. The revolution and the permanence. I found myself to be as featureless as this ocean, as shallow and unoccupied as this bay, a listless wreck without identification. My rocks are these bones and a careful fence to keep the precipice at bay. Shot through me caves, my forehead a mount. This aerial will transmit into me so. All overexposed, the nervous system, where Donnelly's boots and yours and mine still trample. I will carry a torch for you. I will leave it at the foot of my headstone. You will need it for the tunnels that carry me under.
The mount is clearly the focal point of this landscape. It almost appears so well placed as to be artificial. I find myself easily slipping into the delusional state of ascribing purpose, deliberate motive to everything here. Was this island formed during the moment of impact? When we were torn loose from our moorings and the seat belts cut motorway lanes into our chests and shoulders, did it first break surface then? When someone had died or was dying, or was so ill they gave up what little hope they could sacrifice, they cut parallel lines into the cliff, exposing the white chalk beneath. You could see them from the mainland or the fishing boats, and know to send aid or impose a cordon of protection, and wait a generation until whatever pestilence stalked the cliff paths died along with its hosts. My lines are just for this, to keep any would-be rescuers at bay. The infection is not simply of the flesh. We are not like Lot's wife, you and I. We feel no particular need to turn back. There's nothing to be seen if we did. No tired old man parting the cliffs with his arms. No gifts or Bibles laid out on the sand for the taking. No tides turning or the shrieking gulls overhead. The bones of the hermit are no longer laid out for the taking. I have stolen them away to the guts of this island, where the passages all run to black, and where we can light each other's faces by their strange luminescence. Dear Esther, I met Paul. I made my own little pilgrimage. My Damascus, a small semi-detached on the outskirts of Wolverhampton. We drank coffee in his kitchen and tried to connect to one another. Although he knew I hadn't come in search of an apology, reason or retribution, he still spiralled in panic, thrown high and lucid by his own dented bonnet. Responsibility had made him old. Like us, he'd already passed beyond any conceivable boundary of life. This hermit, this seer, this distant historian of bones and old bread, where did he vanish to? Why, asked the farmers, why, asked Jacobson, why bother with your visions at all, if you're just to throw your arms up at the cliff and let it close in behind you and seal you into the belly of the island, a museum shut to all but the most devoted? He still maintains he wasn't drunk, but tired. I can't make the judgment or the distinction anymore. I was drunk when I landed here, and tired too. I walked up the cliff path in near darkness and camped in the bay where the trawler lies beached. It was only at dawn that I saw the bothy and decided to make my temporary lodgings there. I was expecting just the aerial and a transmitter stashed in a weatherproof box somewhere on the mount. It had an air of uneasy permanence to it. Like all the other buildings here, erosion seems to have evaded it completely.
Dear Esther, I have now driven the stretch of the M5 between Exeter and Bristol over 21 times. But although I have all the reports and all the witnesses and have cross-referenced them within a millimetre using my ordnance survey maps, I simply cannot find the location. You'd think there would be marks to serve as some evidence. It's somewhere between the turn-off for Sanford and the welcome brake services. But although I can always see it in my rearview mirror, I have as yet been unable to pull ashore. Imagined answer phone message. The tires are flat, the wheel spins loosely, and the brake fluid has run like ink over this map, staining the landmarks and rendering the coastline mute, compromised. Where you saw galaxies, I saw only bruises cut into the cliff by my lack of sobriety. There must be a hole in the bottom of the boat. How else could new hermits have arrived? I had kidney stones and you visited me in the hospital. After the operation, when I was still half submerged in anaesthetic, your outline and your speech both blurred. Now my stones have grown into an island and made their escape, and you have been rendered opaque by the car of a drunk.
I've begun my ascent on the green slope of the western side. I've looked deep into the mountain from the shaft and understood that I must go up and then find the way under. I will stash the last vestiges of my civilization in the stone walls and work deeper from there. I'm drawn by the aerial and the cliff edge. There is some form of rebirth waiting for me there. The Bothy was constructed originally in the early 1700s. By then, shepherding had formalized into a career. The first habitual shepherd was a man called Jacobson from a lineage of migratory Scandinavians. He was not considered a man of breeding by the mainlanders. He came here every summer whilst building the Bothy, hoping eventually that becoming a man of property would secure him a wife and a lineage. Donnelly records that it did not work. He caught some disease from his malcontented goats and died two years after completing it. There was no one to carve white lines into the cliff for him either. Three cormorants seen at dusk, they did not land. This house built of stone, built by a long dead shepherd. Contents, my camp bed, a stove, a table, chairs, my clothes, my books. The caves that score out the belly of this island, leaving it famished. My limbs and belly famished. This skin, these organs, this failing eyesight. When the battery runs out in my torch, I will descend into the caves and follow only the phosphorescence home. Jacobson's ribcage, they told Donnelly, was deformed, the result of some birth defect or perhaps a traumatic injury as a child. Brittle and overblown it was, and desperately light. Perhaps it was this that finally did for him, unable to contain the shattering of his heart. In half-light, his skeleton a discarded prop, a false and calcified seabird. They found Jacobson in early spring. The thaw had only just come. Even though he'd been dead nearly seven months, his body had been frozen right down to the nerves and had not even begun to decompose. He'd struggled halfway down the cliff path, perhaps looking for some lost goat or perhaps in a delirium, and expired, curled into a claw right under the winter moon. Even the animals shunned his corpse. The mainlanders thought to bring it home unlucky. Donnelly claims they dragged it to the caves to thaw out and rot, but he is proving an unreliable witness. Climbing down to the caves, I slipped and fell and have injured my leg. I think the femur is broken. It is clearly infected. The skin has turned a bright, tight pink, and the pain is crashing in on waves, winter tides against my shoreline, drowning out the ache of my stones. I struggled back to the bothy to rest, but it has become clear that there is only one way this is likely to end. 
The medical supplies I looted from the trawler have suddenly found their purpose. They will keep me lucid for my final ascent. From here, this last time, I have understood there is no turning back. The torch is failing along with my resolve. And hear the singing of the sea creatures from the passages above me, and they are promising the return of the gulls. They'd stop the traffic back as far as the Sanford Junction and come up the hard shoulder like radio signals from another star. It took 21 minutes for them to arrive. I watched Paul time it to the second on his watch.
In my final dream, I sat at peace with Jakobsen and watched the moon over the Sandford Junction. Goats grazed on the hard shoulder, the world gone to weed and redemption. He showed me his fever scars, and I mine, between each shoulder, the nascency of flight. I will hold the hand you offered to me, from the summit down to this well, into the dark waters where the small flowers creep for the sun. Headlights are reflected in your retinas, moonlit in the shadow of the crematorium chimney.
the moon over the Sanford Junction, headlights in your retinas. Donnelly drove a grey hatchback without a bottom. All the creatures of the tarmac rose to sing to him. All manner of symbols crudely scrawled across the cliff face of my unrest. My life reduced to an electrical diagram. All my gulls have taken flight. They will no longer roost on these outcrops. The lure of the moon over the Sanford Junction is too strong. soil I chose fire. It seemed the more contemporary of the options, the more sanitary. I could not bear the thought of the reassembly of such a ruin. Stitching arm to shoulder and femur to hip, charting a line of thread like traffic stilled on a motorway, making it all acceptable for tearful aunts and traumatized uncles flown in specially for the occasion. Reduce to ash, mix with water, make a phosphorescent paint for these rocks and ceilings. the roadside, by the exit for Damascus, all ticking and cooled, all feathers and remorse, all of these signals rooted like traffic through the circuit diagrams of our guts, those badly ridden boats torn bottomless in the swells, washing us forever ashore. see my armada. I collected all the letters I'd ever meant to send to you, if I'd have ever made it to the mainland, but had instead collected at the bottom of my rucksack, and I spread them out along the lost beach. Then I took each and every one, and I folded them into boats. I folded you into the creases, and then, as the sun was setting, I set the fleet to sail. Shattered into 21 pieces, I consigned you to the Atlantic and I sat here until I'd watched all of you sink.
a sound of torn metal, teeth running over the edge of the rocks, a moon that casts a signal as I lay pinned beside you, the ticking of the cooling engine, and the calling from a great height, all my mind as a bypass. I've begun my voyage in a paper boat without a bottom. I will fly to the moon in it. I've been folded along a crease in time, a weakness in the sheet of life. Now you've settled on the opposite side of the paper to me. I can see your traces in the ink that soaks through the fiber, the pulped vegetation. When we become waterlogged and the cage disintegrates, we will intermingle. When this paper aeroplane leaves the cliff edge and carves parallel vapor trails in the dark, we will come together. If only Donnelly had experienced this, he would have realized he was his own shoreline, as am I. Just as I am becoming this island, so he became his syphilis, retreating into the burning synapses, the stones, the infection. back like a nail, like a hangnail, like a drowning man clung onto the wheel, drunk and spiralled, washed onto the lost shore under a moon as fractured as a shattered wing. We cleave, we are flight and suspended, these wretched painkillers, this form inconstant. I will take flight, I will take flight. Stopped on the road to Damascus, Paul sat at the roadside, hunched up like a gull, like a bloody gull. As useless and as doomed as a syphilitic cartographer, a dying goat herd, an infected leg, a kidney stone, blocking the traffic bound for Sanford and Exeter. He was not drunk, Esther, he was not drunk at all. All his roads and his tunnels and his paths led inevitably to this moment of impact. This is not a recorded natural condition. He should not be sat there with his chemicals and his circuit diagrams. He should not be sat there at all.
run out of places to climb. I will abandon this body and take to the air. Dear Esther, I have burnt my belongings, my books, this death certificate. Mine will be written all across this island. Who was Jacobson? Who remembers him? Donnelly has written of him, but who was Donnelly? Who remembers him? I have painted, carved, hewn, scored into this space all that I could draw from him. There will be another to these shores to remember me. I will rise from the ocean like an island without bottom, come together like a stone, become an aerial, a beacon, that they will not forget you. We have always been drawn here. One day the gulls will return and nest in our bones and our history. I will look to my left and see Esther Donnelly flying beside me. I will look to my right and see Paul Jacobson flying beside me. They will leave white lines carved into the air to reach the mainland, where help will be sent. Come back.